Hello and welcome to the convo presented by Leadership Indianapolis. I'm a retail manager of brand communications, and today I am so happy to be talking with Mr. Bob Osley, who is our city county council president of leader here in our community. Councillor Osley, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm doing great. I am doing great. Thanks so much. Glad to be Good. here with you. Awesome. Glad to be talking with you. So there is a lot going on in our community right now um, when you look at what's happening on a national um, landscape as well as what's happening locally. Um, and recently, the council did something quite bold by passing a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. Um, tell us a little bit about where that came from. Um, I know that in the in the resolution, I read it, and it covers a lot of things. You know, inequity um, in food access, infant mortality, policing, redlining. You name it. You guys named a lot of different things that um, people, specifically Black people, deal with um, trying to live and exist here in the city of Indianapolis. Um, where did that resolution come from? It came from the idea of being able to name some of our, the causes of our health disparities, being able to trace it back to their sources. You know, we start with, with the issue of, for example, of redlining. Now, you know, they put black folks, uh, black families in areas that were considered probably the most undesirable. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those were by industrial you know, facilities, uh, factories, and, and so on. Well, you know that in those days, especially, it polluted the air, it contaminated the water. The groundwater was also saturated with impurities. Um, we are experiencing so many of, the, of the, the repercussions of that, the detriments of, of those decisions. And so when we talked about COVID, for example, and you know, uh, the, the co-occurring you know, disorders that go alongside of it, the things that are the most concern, um, we were the most vulnerable people, black people were the most vulnerable um, to COVID. And so much of this is historic. So when we looked at uh, racism as a public health crisis, it was to put some perspective on that. For example, um, where do we see the greatest amount of health challenges? Well, if we, if we can identify that those health challenges had a root and a root cause, then we can also identify those areas that need the most attention. So the idea behind all of this was, to, for, was for us to put it on the table. There's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to hide, these are facts and the impact of racism on the health of black and brown individuals in our community. And then what are we gonna do about it? And so, you know, we laid out a number of historical facts, but the most important thing was for us to be able to say, what are we going to do? We're going to trace back uh, those causes and we're going to address them. We're gonna address them going forward. And we're going to be pointed about why we're addressing them. There's nothing hidden in a closet right now. We know where the sources are and we, we intend to trace them. Let me, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the one of the resolutions had to do with the collection of data and publication of that data to increase transparency and accountability with our public. So we call, we're calling upon all of our agencies, city and county, to begin collecting data disaggregated by race um, on contracting, on procurement, uh, on purchasing, basically on allocation of our government resources. Um, now we could have done this without having done a resolution. Sure, 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 absolutely. But, but by putting it into sort of historical document and tracing so many of the historical disparities it put it into a context that makes it irrefutable. It's very difficult to argue when you see the relationship 
um, between you know history and the results. So um, you know we're going to be addressing these in our budget process, which is coming up in August. Um, we've made all of our department heads aware that we will be addressing this in our 2021 budget, um, and um, to expect us to begin, you know, to be pushing by department, what are the decisions being made to address the racial inequities that are so apparent and become even more apparent since COVID-19 um, so that we can be proactive in addressing them. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, kind of dovetailing off of everything that you shared about the um, formation of the resolution and some of the initiatives that are planned going forward. Um, there's been a little bit of criticism that has come about as well ever since that resolution was passed. Um, some people wondering what makes this legitimate and not just lip service because we've noticed a lot of organizations um, and corporate entities and politicians that have come out in this in the wake of everything that we're experiencing um, particularly the racial um, unrest you know the civil unrest that we've experienced and come out and say you know these grand statements and make these gestures um, what can you say to people that have that little bit of um, skepticism you know towards what it is that the council is doing what would you say to them watch okay watch really that's important it. That's yeah it. yeah i want to you know build upon that because right now you know we're experiencing so much I mentioned the civil unrest, um, a lot of the issues that are brought up in that in that resolution um, against the backdrop of a global pandemic. As a leader, as someone that, you know, you've worked in the fields of, you know, architecture and now in, you know, to politics and whatnot, how do you go about navigating all of this as a leader? Um, and what are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way that have helped you thrive during this time? Uh, the lessons are that you can't do it on your own, that you've got to get uh, allies and accomplices um, to work alongside of you. Um, someone basically today pointed out um, the difference to me between an ally and an accomplice. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I didn't know it. Um, but basically, you know, the, the distinction that was made was an accomplice will walk with you, will go to jail with you, will fight with you, you know, or fight alongside of you. And an ally will just simply cheer you on um, from the safety of, of, of the rafters. So um, the, the biggest lesson uh, is, is collaboration and coordination because we can't do it on, on, you know, on our own. We, no one has sole resources to make it happen. And so, <clears throat> You know, once again, I, 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 I want to stress that it is also important to, to lay out an argument that is irrefutable. And maybe some folks don't, you know, don't get that and that's fine. But to me, it is, it is essential that what you say is irrefutable so that when you take action on those facts that you have laid out that are irrefutable, it, there is nowhere to go to try and stop the individual, you know? Um, uh, anyone who says we should not address these historical racial inequities, he or she will now be put in a position to justify why we would not do it. So that's why I say um, we could take action immediately. Of course we could but watch these next few months. The argument has been made, and if you oppose it, show us why. Yeah. Yeah. I wanna um, shift gears a little bit, um, you know, speaking, you know, on behalf of all of the different issues that we've discussed so far, I'm interested to hear your candid perspective as a black man, um, 
having not only witnessed what's happening, but I'm sure you have your own personal experiences as well to draw from um, that maybe mirror some of the things that we're seeing being played out on, on a larger stage. What do you make of all of this? Um, and what are some of the things that go through your mind every day um, when you're trying to figure out how to deal with this internally and then make decisions for a community um, as well in the face of, of everything that's going on? I thank you for the question and it's a thoughtful one. Uh, there's no refuting that I'm a black man. Um, and there is probably no refuting to at least other black people that, um, that there's a distinction made in this country um, in just daily living. That pretty much if you leave your, your neighborhood, sometimes if you walk out the house, you're reminded that you're a black person. And I think what has been different now is that um, whether it's our culture here locally, you know, a very polite culture, one doesn't necessarily talk about those things. Uh, I think there's been sort of a tacit like um, acceptance that racism exists and, you know, it just, it is, that's just the way life is, you know, uh, move on, get on, you know, you know, get over it. But this particular time in our history has made it pretty clear that no, that, that isn't acceptable. It's not. And, uh, you know, I don't talk a lot, um, you know, you don't see me posting a lot, you know, but when I say something, I, I, I mean it. Um, this time is for all to understand um, that the country uh, treats people differently based on their shell. And uh, there's a complicity that goes alongside of that, a complicity to accept it, uh, a complicity to take part in it. Um, and that's got to be called out. And um, part of wanting to speak directly to race and racism is so that we can normalize the discussion that we do have a racist past. Um, that being black in America is not the same as being white in America. And there should not, in the grand scheme, and based on the, on, on the commitments that were made in the Constitution, um, I think we should all be uh, able to pursue our, our happiness. And sometimes that happiness is impacted by other people's um, disregard of, uh, of individuals, once again, based on their shells. Uh, that's got to be called out. And um, uh, this is the time, if we're going to do it, that we continue this dialogue. You know, I, I mentioned a moment ago when you asked about um, how, how, at least how I process things, and it is getting alliances, accomplices, allies, all of those things, who can see it and are willing to go, are willing to go down with you. Uh, I, for one, don't want to be in a place where, where I am supporting and accepting anymore a historical reality that has impacted this country for, for 400 years. And, and what's really great, and I, I talk about this lady a whole bunch, but it's my mother. Mm -hmm. um, a 96 year old woman, black, black woman, Christmas addicts grad, uh, you know, Purdue grad, who will tell you, you know, to this day, and will show you to this day, a sort of dignity um, of blackness. And um, not just that you can overcome, that's fine. But you shouldn't have to pursue overcoming. Your pursuit should be for your happiness that's not impacted by someone else's disregard. That's powerful. I'm gonna have to ruminate on, the, on that concept of pursuing our happiness. It gives me something to think about. So thank you for sharing. Um, going back to your point about dialogue, um, my last question for you, um, 
is is on is in that vein. So your name Bob stands for Voice of the People. Um, how can leaders use their voices um, to help address address the things that are going on and really seek change in the future? So it's a nickname, just so you know. Yeah, it's a nickname that my course. mother, my father gave me yeah. <laughs> as like a toddler because apparently yeah. I, I talked way too much. Um, how can leaders use their voice? Yes. By speaking directly to things that are uncomfortable. By being willing to talk about race, racism, to talk about blackness, to talk about you know, disparities, to talk about privilege, um, and to normalize that, that discussion because we don't move until we address something. It's just human nature. If you and I had a falling out, if we didn't address it and get to the root of the problem, there would always be some schism between you and me, right? In the same thing, the same way, I think with black America versus you know, the rest of America, and we can maybe brown America as well, but um, until we normalize that discussion and are able to say, you know what, that was pretty racist, or that decision has a negative impact on black people or brown people, that, that, that decision benefits you at the expense of somebody else. So we can have that discussion pretty straightforwardly and there's nowhere for someone else to hide from it, to deny it. You know, one of the worst things is for someone to deny something that you know is true. It is, it is the ultimate uh, disregard of the other person's humanity. So if there's no room for denial, you, have, you, have, you basically have you know, two choices. Go with what you know is right or try to justify what you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think our leaders in our community have got to be uh, equipped and should be comfortable being uncomfortable and making sure that others understand that a, a, a true discussion will have discomfort in it. We, we don't have to be ugly. Facts don't have to be ugly. They just have to be facts um, with a basis. And we can take them and, and be upset with them or we can accept them and say, you know what, I can't do anything about that. It is true. I can't hide from it. So what am I gonna do next to rectify whatever that fact un, un, unveiled? Uh, leaders, um, it's just speaking uh, plainly and clearly. Thank you so much. So many, so many different things um, that I think will be very, very impactful um, for those that are listening. So again, Counselor Osley, thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment to our community. And I appreciate you speaking with us today. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Yes, you're very welcome. And thank each and every one of you that tuned in for this week's convo. Stay tuned to our website and our social media for more.